Hello everybody, James here. Story time with Dutch Mantel, episode 65. What are you shuffling around in the background there for, Dutch? Getting my uh, cigar ready. Ah, very good. You know, I, I never liked this, but I always just like to... You rubbed me the wrong way. Got your marks? You rubbed me the wrong way. I don't know how you rubbed me. <laughs> don't ever ask me to rub you, Dutch. That will... <laughs> you don't pay me enough. Uh, oh God, yeah, plugs, yes, books. Uh, we've got two. Uh, I, we've got four. Dutch has got two. I've got two. Oh, Dutch, I keep telling you how tied I am. Dutch has got two. The world according to Dutch and Tales from a Dirt Road. They're both available from Amazon. And if you want them signed, go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail dot com. He also has university certificates and more. Just contact him, and you can get your signed merchandise from the man himself. I have two books as well, and they are whoops, clang. Uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the People's Champion, and Owen Hart, King of Pranks, both available from Amazon, both fine, fine biographies do, 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 written by actors. Yes. Do they come? Do you autograph your books? No. Uh, I'm purely well, I, shipping, <clears throat> uh, 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 Amazon shipping for me. I don't do the book signing thing. Your, your autograph may be worth thousands of dollars. Hey, one thing, I don't mean to change the subject. Mm. But we were talking about Gary Hart's book. Yes. And now it's a collector's item. You, and you didn't said, believe me. I wouldn't know. I didn't. Well, it was hard for me to believe. You, you said but you said you it's threw like the flag two, on it. Yes, I did. But <laughs> instant replay. Good thing we got instant replay. Several people wrote me and they said it's it's up to a eight hundred to a thousand dollars now. Mm-hmm. I mean, my God. I mean, it's a collector's item. It's not because of the the book is some gigantic expose into anything, but it's just they just it just must have been a one run book and there's no more. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you got them made, but hey, what if my book went up to like $5,000? I think you would have to be like assassinated. And that. <laughs> Like <laughs> no, uh, I don't want to be a. Listen, don't put it in people's heads. <laughs> They're going to assassinate yeah. Dutch. Yeah, if you oh have a God. signed book by Dutch Mantel, your look might be in your. But but I I just wanted to say that you were right, and I was not necessarily wrong, but I was misinformed. But it is worth quite a bit of money. Hmm? Gary, what's the name of the book? I mean, you forgot the name of the book. I don't even remember the name of the book. Just Gary Hart book. I can find out. Yeah. Okay. It, but it was up to a thousand dollars, and I mean, it's only worth what you can get somebody to give you for. That's what it's worth. Hmm. But if somebody wants a thousand dollars, that's that's what it's worth to them. And, and if somebody wants to pay that, they can get it. These are serious, serious collectors who would buy this book. My Life in Wrestling with a Little Help from My Friends, or The Republic of Conscious, and uh, yeah, The Republic of Conscious by Gary Hart, the former senator. So uh, one's worth more than the other, and it is the wrestling one, I yeah. suspect. My Life in Wrestling is the Gary Hart, th the manager. Yeah. And the other one is Gary Hart. He was, I don't know if he was a senator or not. I may be wrong on that too, but I remember the name. He's a political figure. I'm yeah. trying to. I'm trying to look. What's I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're going to move. In fact, actually, there's one. A couple more plugs we need to do. Uh, please give us five stars on iTunes wherever you can rate us highly. Uh, we're out every Friday and every Tuesday. We do a fan question episode that you can write into at questionsfordutch at gmail dot com. And goodness me, you're doing that. Let me tell you, we're just getting dozens and dozens every week and also i have a new podcast out with shane douglas we are calling it franchise university with shane douglas also available every tuesday morning and full episodes and clips are released on shane douglas official the youtube channel every day now so how is your shane douglas uh, podcast doing it is early days trickling up you, you really have to build mm -hmm. these things you really really have to build the, uh, these things we got a uh, I think we jumped up a couple of thousand subscribers in like a few days, which is actually really, oh, that's really good. good. That's good. Hey, we, do you know of a wrestling podcast called Monty and the Pharaoh? I've heard of them. Why? <laughs> Barry Horowitz was on the other day. <laughs> and the question was, 
And it was like w- one part of the question put me over. And then the second part of the question was like a backhanded slap. It says, why is it that Dutch Mantel is universal, universally respected within the wrestling business, but he never drew a dime. <laughs> and somebody sent that to me and I went, wait a minute. What is the purpose of that question? I don't, I don't understand it, but I did draw. I actually drew a quarter one time. I did that. I went to the ring and I had some paper and I drew out a quarter, <laughs> but 25 cents. So I did draw 15 cents more than a dime. So, so who are these guys? They don't have many subscribers. They have like, I oh, got 11,000, but. Mm, no, not really. I don't know, just some YouTubers, I guess, who've been doing it a long time and have awful microphones. Do they? Yeah, they just talk into them like, wait. I've heard them very, very briefly quite a while ago, and they just all just, oh, we talk like, you know, they're way too close to the microphone. It's very annoying. Anyway, uh, I've not watched any of this stuff, really. What did okay. Barry Horowitz just... have to say about you? No, it was just a clip. Uh-oh. And then when he started to answer, they, they cut out. I'm going to have to go back and see what he said, because if he doesn't put me over that little bastard, mm. I'm going to run him down and beat the dog crap out of him. You should do. I'd like to see that. No, I, I like I like Barry. Because I did that loser gimmick with him. Oh, he got over like a son of a bitch. And it was a fun, it was a fun gimmick to watch. And... And it just shows how how sadistic wrestling fans are. Here's this guy out, you know, complaining that he was a, a state champion in Florida, but he would just he he just can't seem to win any matches in professional wrestling. Oh, they would be on him from the time he would leave that dressing room <laughs> to the time he got back. But it was it was a it was a fun gimmick, a fun angle. And to add uh, credence to it, WWF picked it up and used it for Barry Horowitz while he was there. Mm -hmm. And there was so much they could have done with that. But then after he won the first match and it's over, they dropped it and he started, he went back losing again. (laughs) I don't know why they would do that. Why would you invest in doing this angle that got over and then all of a sudden just stopped doing it? I don't know. But there was a lot of things in WWF and even some things in WWE that I don't understand why they do it, but they do. So, Before we get to the news, I just want to uh, pay tribute to you as somebody who sometimes it can be quite challenging to get the right camera and the right microphone and everything sorted. But this time you came on, it was absolutely perfect. That's maybe the first time that's happened in months. You know, because I have, I've read your book or your pamphlet, about how to do a podcast and get it right the first time by James. Mm. I read that and I followed everything you said, and this is the result. I won't sign that pamphlet for you. I don't do signings. <laughs> That's how my signature says so valuable. Listen, let's uh, let's do some news because we've got a billion newses to go through. And the, okay, uh, let's go. And the main one what is... I, what I want to hear about, Yes, and I think all the fans do too, is your trip to Wembley. But we'll get to that in a minute. We will do. We will do. Because, oh, if you want to have the very, very long-form version of that, go on to WSI. I posted a review of my uh, day in Wembley as well and uh, how much I hate London, basically, on it as well. It's so expensive. But before we do, let's get to the big news. A few hours after we stopped recording, and I woke up the morning after you'd messaged me and told me, this was the first I'd actually seen, it was that Bray Wyatt Wyndham Rotunda had died. Mm-hmm. Uh, hours after recording the news of the death uh, from last week, excuse me, of Wyndham Rotunda, a.k.a. A. Bray White, shook the wrestling world. Wyndham died in his sleep at the age of 36. After contracting COVID in March, he developed heart complications, a weak lower part of his heart. That's a quote in the weeks leading up to his death. But he had been training up for a return to the ring with his dad, Mike Rotunda, just a couple of weeks prior, saying he'd be returning to the ring imminently. He had been hospitalised a week prior with heart issues and had a follow-up appointment with doctors the morning he died where they advised him to continue wearing an external heart defibrillator for people susceptible to sudden cardiac arrest. The device was found in his car. Many had speculated, including us, 
that Bray had taken his ball and gone home over creative differences in March, leading him to miss WrestleMania that year and basically just disappear from the roster. But uh, the information wasn't available at the time, the true re- reason. And a th- a speculation ran rampant that that was the most likely reason. And we ran with it. Many, many people ran with it. But uh, overall thoughts on the passing of Bray White? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure I'm like thousands and thousands and thousands of other people, I was I was shocked by his heart attack. And uh, at thirty six, that's that that's that's a young man. That's my age. He was actually he age. was bull crap. Um, You're we forty five anyway. Bray Wyatt was six months younger than me. Okay, really? Yeah. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. I'm just kidding you. But uh, Bray Wyatt, his, you know, and I have been on the negative side of of his character, not him. Bray, he's a good guy. But of his character, because I didn't quite understand it. But then again, I'm not the arbiter of whether a guy gets over or not. I can tell you whether I like it or not, but I can tell the people liked it. Because he would walk out with his lantern and everybody would put their phone up or whatever. And it was actually a, really a spectacle to see. See, the, my only drawback about Bray was in his interviews. He would do an interview, and but I didn't understand the interview. I don't understand what he was saying. So when he finished, I would sit back and I went, hmm. What did he say? And what was the meaning of it? See, I'm not like some people, some fans. They they put meaning to everything. Well, I, I put I didn't put I put little meaning to what Bray was saying because it was his character, but I, I didn't I just didn't get it. Now, as far as his work was concerned, it was it was good, it was great. And I think they tried to make him a heel, but he wasn't a heel. The people did not dislike him they're not going to boo him but yet they tried to keep going and going and going with the bray wyatt family but there was nothing you know it it would you know i keep saying you got to check the temperature in the room and if the people aren't booing him or disliking him why keep him that way make him a baby face and get him a big nasty you know, unlikable heel to work with and go from there. So you actually, Bray Wyatt's character violated almost every uh, position that we know about pro wrestling. It's the, it's the protagonist and the anti-protagonist and, you know, it's the good guy, it's the bad guy. But, but then placing him as a bad guy, I didn't think worked. So when he disappeared, this is what I thought, and I've said this, and I'm not—I will, I won't shy away from saying it. I think either he was writing it, and he got sick, and he went home. That—that's you know probably what happened. But I think they just d- didn't know where to go with it. So, and he even worked with uh, L.A. Knight, and L.A. L.A. Knight was the one who actually got over more than Bray Wyatt got over during their little program together. And L.A. Knight lost. So we see where he is right now. And uh, it, it, it it was a tough thing to take. Hmm. And my condolences to the family and to Mike. I know those, I, I know his father well. And to his brother, you know, my condolences to them. So that's what I got to say about it. Uh, I'll talk a tiny bit more about his character. Of all the characterizations of Bray White, I think he came in as a sort of, you know, with the White family and Luke Harper and Eric the Red, uh, yep. Eric Redbeard. And a couple of like lost years where he was like tagging with Matt Hardy and stuff and he wasn't really in the main event picture then he was the fiend and then he was this new version of Bray with the Uncle Howdy sort of thing which of those iterations did you enjoy the most or see the most uh, upside to well 
I, I saw an upside to Bray if they would have. They would have. I, I think basically they just needed to switch him, take him to a good guy, to a baby face, and leave him. Now that left the other two guys out. I think what would have, what would have happened, was if the other two guys had turned against him. Now you may have something, because now you got two. Nobody wants to team with Bray. You could go a month or two with nobody wanting to team with him because nobody understood him. Then getting a partner like Brian Daniels or Brian Danielson or whatever his name is now to join him. Now you got something, and and go from there. Uh, with Bray, but I, I, oh, I but I would think I would think his best shot at uh, picking a position to go is a single. Let him be a single and go from there. Because I'm not on the creative team. I don't know what they what they envisioned for him. But for a long time, and and when he left, his writer, and I know the writer well, because he, he used to do, do the writing for the Zeb Coulter character, uh, he left too. Mm. So I don't know if that's any connection to him leaving or I, I don't know. See, WWE is a it's a strange universe there. So we can speculate all day long why this happened, why that happened. So unless we hear from the people involved, and I don't know where this writer is now. I don't. I don't. I I even forgot his name, but I don't know what happened. But the guy's no longer there. So that that led more of speculation that something happened behind the scenes and only they will know about it. Uh, the writer's name was Nick Manfredini. Yeah. Manfredini. Yep. Nick. I knew him as Nick. You don't really get last names in WWE, really. Mm. You get first names. He was Nick. I knew him as Nick. And if somebody asked me his last name, I couldn't tell you. What was Wind Rotunda like personally in the locker room? Bray? Oh, he was a good guy. In any see, WWE was is it was even in the back, it's so big. You got sometimes 80, 80 performers back there. And you got a lot of people that are not on the show that are there just running around. So he may be on one end of the building and I could be on the other end. So I'm, if, uh, the only way for our pass to cross, if it crossed up gorilla position. Hmm. So he was, he was, he was a good guy, <clears throat> really good to be around. Even though I wasn't around him that much, he was always very respectful and very courteous. And I don't know if that's because of my tenure in the business or it, but I think he was like that with everybody. Because it takes, it costs you zero dollars to be nice to people, zero. So, and it's a lot easier to be nice than to be a be an asshole. It's what I've not always went out of my way not to be, to be a smart ass to somebody. But he was a good guy, and a lot of people, a lot of people liked him. I read a a recent story about him. It was, I think, Liv Morgan. I think maybe. It was a girl that was that had this type of match, and they was going to involve tables and do all this stuff. And Bray Wyatt took her to the ring, and actually walked her through her match, and helped her a lot. Now he didn't have to do that. He's not an agent. He just wanted to help the girl, and she let that be known that he helped her a lot because she knew, even though she's in the wrestling business, doesn't. I necessarily mean you know how to do a match. Different matches are, you know, they they contain different things, different ways to go into them. But if nothing else, he kind of talked to this girl and he calmed her down so she could think about it rationally and she could go out and do it. And the, the thing is that he didn't have to do that. That's an ageist job. But just because the guy's an agent doesn't mean he knows how to do it either. 
but because having those hardcore matches are are very are very different and they can put a lot of stuff in it. But if you told me to do a hardcore match now, I'd say, ah, I'd rather not. Mm-hmm. I'll just go to just have him pin me. <laughs> 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 and let's make it easy on everybody. Let's even make it easy on the fans. <laughs> just have him pin me one, two, three, and to get up. I said, "Well, he lost again," and then leave. So, <laughs> what did you think of the SmackDown tribute? Because uh, just to mention as well, a couple of things. One, they didn't skimp on the tribute to Terry Funk either. They gave him your video packages. Yep, they did. People went out yep. talked to him. They gave him his due as well. But uh, on Bray and. Uh, 2.647 million viewers tuned in. The best rating SmackDown has done since Christmas Day 2020. So nearly three years. So a lot of fans or even Laps fans tuned in for this one to see what WWE would say about Bray. Do you think they did justice to him? Uh, well, I think so. But I'm watching. See, I have another job. I hate that word job. I've always tried to stay away from jobs all my life. But... On uh, I, I watch SmackDown on Friday night for the Sports Kita Network, and I do a report on the show immediately following uh, when SmackDown goes off. So I'm watching SmackDown, and they open it up with a tribute to Bray, and I think they come back from break. Then there's a tribute to Terry, and it's. It's wild, really. Two guys that I knew, I knew Terry a lot better than I knew Bray, but two guys that I knew pass away within a day of each other. That's never happened before. So, and and I knew that, you know, they write, they write SmackDown at least a week out. So, and having Bray at... I think he had died that day. Didn't he die on a Friday? Mm. Sorry, mouthful of water. No, he died on Thursday. Okay, he died on a Thursday. So they had to act. And that show was probably written on a Tuesday or, or Monday or Tuesday. Mm. They had to rewrite that whole show. Maybe not all of it, but most of it. Uh, and the show was good for one hour. And then when it went into that second hour, it's just like you was watching two different teams of creative creating the same show. First hour was good, and the second hour wasn't. But that's that's the rest of it. Is I've seen a lot of shows that didn't have dual deaths that they were doing tributes on that they sucked too. But it's a uh, I don't. I don't even know how you would rate SmackDown because of uh, Terry and Bray both passing away. Well, that's an outlier, isn't it? I mean, it's not. That's not going to happen it, often. Well, it is. It is an outlier. And then Cody Rhodes come at the top of the hour to give a tribute to Terry, and then of course he had to mention Bray, but it was almost like that was. Well, I got to mention this too. Uh, but anyway, it was a, it was a, it was weird watching SmackDown when they're trying to, trying to tribute two guys, give a tribute to two guys who passed away. Mm-hmm. Before we go any farther, ladies and gentlemen, we had a guest. Can I talk about that? Yeah, we both we both bet that he wouldn't turn up. Okay, we had a guest. I mean, before we get weighted down and the Terry Funk and the Bray Wyatt tribute show. We had a guest scheduled for today, and it's a kid. I still call him a kid. Hell, he's 50-some years old. I had a kid that was going to come on the show, Jamie Dundee. And if you're not familiar with Jamie, he's a trip. You don't know what he's going to say, what he's going to do, who he's, who he's going to implicate, who who is going to accuse? Who's going to implicate? Uh, so, but guess what? Jamie is a wall. We had him ready to come on, and uh, James, you talked to him or exchanged emails with him. Yeah, this week. Yeah, yes, yeah, because yes you, or no, you and he 
both messaged me the same day saying that he wanted to come back on. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, let's set it up because I'd love to have him on. He has, he has stories and they're all true stories. My poor editor, I, my poor huh? editor, like the bleep machine's going to be going like crazy. Oh, but Jamie, I knew him. I'm going to give you just a little precast here. I knew him when he was about eight years old or nine. And he was a, he was a scallion then. He was always getting into trouble. His father's Bill Dundee. And, and then he grew up, of course, quite naturally. He got into the, what? The professional wrestling business. And he never weighed more than 170 pounds. But he had such a way about him. Uh, people just hated him because he was such a smart ass. Oh, they wanted to kill him sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> Hell, I've seen sometimes I wanted to kill him. But one time I was in Charlotte, and Bill Dundee was working in Charlotte, so Bill took his family, and I took mine. And I went out to lunch one day with my wife, and she was driving, and I'm sitting at a red light, and he's he's like 13 and I'm sitting there like this, and I look over into the car that pulls up on my right side like this. It was Jamie Dundee driving the car. He was in his daddy's Cadillac or whatever they had. And I went like this. I went, like, roll your window down. He rolled the window down. I said, what are you doing? Nothing. I said, Get your ass home and park that car right now. And he took it home and parked it. And he said that night, because we had to go work. We had a, a town we had to go to. And I was riding with Bill. He says, oh, my God, I know he's going to come in. He's going to beat the living shit of me. I know Dutch is going to tell him. But he came home and Bill didn't say nothing. He said, well. He's just waiting. He's, he's going to surprise me. So that whole weekend, because I, I, I'm around Bill every day, and he's he's expecting Bill to come through the door and just beat the crap out of him because of driving the car. But it didn't happen. So after a week goes by, he says, well, maybe nothing's going to happen. But he he didn't know if I told him or not. But I didn't tell him. Finally, it was at least 20 years later. We're all, we're all in this show around Nashville, and it was and uh, Jamie was on it, I was on it, and Bill was on it, and that's finally when I stooged off Jamie. <laughs> I said, "Bill, there's something I needed to tell you about 20 years ago." What, mate? What is it, mate? I says, "You know, your little son here, when he was about 13, I caught him in Charlotte. I caught him at a red light driving your car." What, mate? What the hell? Oh, he got mad as hell. He would have probably tried to beat Jamie's ass then <laughs> if he could have. But now Jamie's grown up. He's a he's an adult guy. He's a he's an adult man. So Bill didn't think he would he could get it done. But I did stooge him off. But it was twenty years later. So that to me ha has to dictate dictate what type of person I am. I didn't stooge the kid off. So, but anyway, we're looking for him. Hopefully. It there it is. There it is. Folks, if, if you're wondering what I'm doing here, my camera does this every time, but it doesn't do it starting off. It does it. Whoop. <laughs> it, it's somewhere. And this is in the first 15 minutes of the show, right? Yeah, a little later than that. Yeah, it's taken a bit of a while to kick in. While you sort of like, <laughs> while you sway back and forth, I'm going to move on to the... Uh... The next bit of news. Uh, listen, this I really want to get and to listen, the Hulk Hogan when you, one when well. you When you're listening to me, I'm all over the place. James, it is your duty and responsibility to keep me on the tracks. I know. Would you, you're just doing this back and forth as well. It's just a new element. A new element I've got to wrangle now. Okay, next bit. CM Punk versus Jungle Boy backstage fights. Both are suspended now because of it. Now, you know the story. In fact, you messaged me yep. earlier and said we should talk about it. 
Uh, I'm going to do some reading, so bear with me. Many different versions of the story have surfaced, but essentially Jungle Boy Jack Perry at All In did some bumps onto a limo on the All In pre-show in his match against Hook. He looks into the camera and says, it's real gra- uh, grass. It's real glass. Cry me a river. <laughs> Don't worry about the grass. Uh, Punk is next match to get into a scuffle at gorilla position. Samoa Joe is then very unhappy because he has to break up the fights, which explains why Joe had blood on him before the match started with CM Punk, which I only realised today. So here's what uh, well, here's what happened according to Brian Alvarez and Wrestling Observer. Here's what went down. Perry said something to the effect of, well, you heard what I said out there. According to several people, Punk said something to the effect of, you know I can beat your ass, right? There was a quick incident and nearly 100% of people Alvarez spoke with say Punk made the comment and either shoved or pie-faced Perry and then put him in a guillotine headlock. It was immediately broken up soon after they got close enough to Tony Khan, who was in the gorilla position that monitors were apparently knocked down onto Tony Khan. Alvarez said that unlike the brawl following All Out, there were lots of witnesses to this happening, including Khan himself. Alvarez said that Punk was furious about the situation and several people said he threatened to quit and didn't want to go out for his match against Samoa Joe, which caused a delay. Alvarez said he heard that the results of uh, th- that resulted in AEW personnel going to FTR and the Young Bucks about opening the show, but they weren't ready to do so, and etc, etc. But that's the fight itself. So, you've heard what I've got to say, you've heard what has apparently happened. What do you think? Well... <laughs> well... Hey, I've said this before. There's a, the best stories in the AEW are backstage. That's the best ones. Hey, oh, start having everybody have a camera and get everything and then go back and pick out the best, the best of the week and then put it on your show. It's funny you said that, Dutch, because they did at one point have a roving camera backstage for a documentary. And but, what did they do? They completely ignored the suspensions of CM Punk and the fight, and they didn't. The, the one thing people are interested in, and they refused to acknowledge it in any way for, due to legal reasons. Well, you know, I, I took that. I, I'm not getting off topic here, but I am. I I used that as a gimmick. I called it the paparazzi cam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I put two guys backstage. They would be catching. You're not supposed to get what they're saying, but he would peek up behind the camera, a wall, and then they look and he'd go back. And But you heard what they were saying. Uh, they, they were saying, I did a lot of angles that way because it was, it's actually so stupid, it's good. Because who would think there's a camera back there it just if you overthink it. But I have said time and time again about Tony Khan, I respect uh, his love for the business. I respect that he actually put his uh, money where his mouth was and he opened up another company, but I think he needs to take charge of it because these guys, sometimes it's a weird world backstage at a pro wrestling show. How, how exactly does he need to take charge? Because these guys seem to, they're, they're running things when he should be running things. No, 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 no. But I mean, a specific instance of how should he take charge? Not because it's easy to say he should t- ch- take charge because he should do. But how does he do well, it? He's, he's let it go this far. How does he do it now? Well, he may have taken charge because allegedly he suspended both Jungle Boy and CM Punk. But CM Punk... Isn't he the reason they got that show at Warner Brothers anyway? Or mm-hmm. so yeah. he's a, and so how's he going to explain that to to the people putting the show on? So I don't know. I don't know what he's got to do, but I think there are some people, uh, especially younger guys, who don't know how lucky they are that they have a place other than WWE to go work. Where are they going to work? Independence, pick up $300 for whatever they pick up. Mm-hmm. Or Tony Khan's going to give them 200000 a year or 150 or whatever he's given them. I mean, and that's that's locked in. So these guys need to understand, like Jungle Boy, that he's very lucky to have a situation that he's in right now. 
And he went out there, and to me, Jungle Boy was the one who started this. Because when he went out uh, and put the guy through the windshield of the car during the, the pay-per-view, he turned to it, hey, this is real glass, cry me a river. That, a river. that was a direct shot saying, hey, punk, what are you going to do about this? So when he come back, you know, punk heard it, and punk's looking at him, and uh, uh, what did he say to punk? Did you like the match or <clears throat> – uh, let me just find the quote. Bear with me. Uh, well, you heard what I said out there. Yeah. And then he says, you know, I can beat your ass. That's exactly what he said. And that's what got it started. And then uh, he pushed him and then he he, he put a, a choke lock on him. And, and then Joe, who had the, the foresight, said, guys, stop this bull crap. Let's don't, let's don't act like 16 year old kids here because that's what they were doing. And then on the, and on top of that, Tony Khan is sitting right there and allegedly they knocked some stuff over on him mm -hmm. when they hit the table or whatever they hit. So, and now I think he was forced in this situation to make a, to make make a statement like you're you're suspended and you're suspended. So we'll see where it goes. But he needs to take he needs to take charge. And the boss, ultimately, everything that happens in that company goes back to Tony Khan. He's the owner. He makes the rules. He makes he's paying everybody. He's the money guy. So he he gets to make the rules. So, but he needs to, I, I don't, I, I think they like him, but I also think that Tony wants to be, uh, like one of the boys, as they say, one of the guys can't do that. You cannot do that really, because it's going to have a adversarial, you like that word, adversarial, uh, conditions applied back to him. So it's, it, from what I'm hearing from respectable journalists like who'd you read alvarez or yeah, alvarez yeah <laughs> so he just getting it from somebody else but i don't know i think it's a mess so let me they need to straighten it out let me let me just uh clarify this then you said you put jungle boy at more at fault than cm punk yes i do we're starting it but you can't well, – let me just rephrase that. Punk is in a position of leadership. He should have said, get in the back. Don't even talk to me right now. Go do his match, then come back, and then do whatever he's going to do. Or talk to Tony about it. Because Tony, he had to see the lack of respect that Jungle Boy had for Punk. Total lack of respect. You think I would – if I was in WWE and I've been in this business a long time, you think I was going to come back and you know, this is back, back in the day, Pat Patterson is standing there and I'm going to say something smart ass to him. And I'm not going to fight anybody and, and Pat's not going to fight, but you know, Pat's going to go and said, Hey, you need to do something about this guy. They do something about Dutch. Either let him go or do something, but that's the way it works. But punk should have actually, uh, reacted as if he was in a position of leadership and uh, taking care of it later is should, what I'd say. Should someone be fired for this or is that taking it too far? No, I think somebody needs to be fired. I think Jungle Boy and CM Punk should be fired. Really? But Tony could come back, but they got suspended. So, but are they suspended with pay or not? Oh, they're probably suspended with pay. In fact, I just want to bring See, this up what, to you. Yeah, uh, what is the purpose then? Are they getting paid? I don't know. I mean, I th that's not been revealed. I don't think it matters either way because All Out, the second pay-per-view in as many weeks, is going to be happening on September the 3rd in Chicago. And do you Ooh. think they're going to be running at a Chicago event without CM Punk on the card? <laughs> Hell, that might make me want to take it. 
to see how Chicago is going to react with that CM Punk on the card. He's he's a Chicago boy. He's their favorite. So that is something to, you know, Tony Khan has got a big ha- head of dark hair. How long is it going to be before it's gray? Unless he dies it. Uh, so, I, I don't. I don't know. That's a question I can't possibly answer. <laughs> well, so you don't dye your that, hair. Your your hair's still quite dark, and you're in your seventies. No, but I am. Uh, but I I do, I, I do get accused of dyeing my yeah. hair. You dye the mustache. I know that. Well, I did before. I don't now. So. Dying a mustache is a lot different than dying your hair, though. I was joking. That. I was going to say you were dying it white or gray or whatever it is. Well, I, kn- I know, but I used to dye it. But I, I never dye it black. Hmm. I dye it that mid-brown. Because you can... If, and I'm going to tell you what. If, if anybody's going to dye a mustache, watch it. Because it's very, very uh, time-conditional. I mean, if you leave it on or just... 30 seconds too long, it's gone. Why it just melts? Black. For, oh, oh, the brown. The it, brown turns no, black. It, 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 you no, know, it just gets too dark, and it looks like hell. It looks like, oh, my phone's it's doing it again. So, but <laughs> right. anyway. Just, be, just before we get onto this, uh, I'll mention two more things. Uh, get off this, I should say. CM Punk and Miro. If I was Tony Khan, I would take CM Punk and, and uh, Jungle Boy into a room. And dye his beard. And I, no, I just... <laughs> I just slapped the shit out of either one up. And I said, oh, do you want to do something about it? Do it, do it, do it. And then see what happens. Yeah. See? Now go do your job, damn it. Next one is Punk and Miro may or may not have had a backstage confrontation. We don't know, so we won't refer to it. But there is one more thing about Punk. He was unhappy uh, because no one had arranged transport transport from the airport to the stadium for him. And y- yeah, you picked up on this as well. So, well, what did you make of it? Were you were you trying to tell me beforehand that it was a conspiracy to wind up Punk from Tony Khan? Oh, but I heard later that nobody had transportation yeah. lined up. Now with WWE, I will say this: from the time you get on that plane in New York or Miami or Atlanta, going over to the across the pond to the mother country. I hope you're happy now. I called it the mother country. Mm. But by the time you get off that plane, then you go through immigration. You're just, you're, you're, you always have an attendant. They'll take you right to your car. They'll take you right to your hotel. They'll help take your bags in. I mean, you're catered to WWE. I, I will say that for them. You're catered to. And then you go in, you get your room, they take your bags up. All you got to do is go in a room. And then the next day, you you get on a bus, you you go to wherever you're going. Then you finish that night. And then you go to the next town that night. And you go into the hotel. Guess what you got waiting for you? Mm -hmm. A, A meal. It's catered. I don't care if it's three o'clock in the morning, you walk in and you sit down in the restaurant and you have a meal that's catered to you right then. So I will say that WWE treats uh, their performers like they should be treated. They, they, they walk you the time you get off that plane, the time you get back on it, you always got an attendant. If you need something, you just tell them and it's taken care of. Now, as far as punk, if he had to find his own way, well, he's in a wrestling business. That should be nothing new to him. But but I don't know why they didn't tell him before that he'd have to find his own way to the stadium. Why didn't they tell him that? Because he, he came in later, didn't he, than everybody else? I think, yeah, he probably came in late, I think, yeah. So, if you, oh, London Underground System's really hard to deal with. I, I've been on all three of like the most famous ones, so uh, London, New York, Tokyo. Yeah. Tokyo was the most unfathomable until you worked it out and then it was okay. New York's is really easy, but London Underground I find so difficult to to maneuver well, around. Okay, you're talking about the subway system in New York? Yeah. 
That's really easy to deal with, I think. I heard it was horrible. Oh, you know, there's all the people like sticking guns and knives in your face and demanding your wallet, of course, but you have to navigate those people. But uh, as far as as far as simplicity's sake, no, it's it's quite good. Listen, we're going to move on. We've got a couple more but bits. Wait of a minute, news. you don't got... you don't have guns in England, do you? No, but there's loads in New York. I read in an article once. Okay, all right. No, there's no. Continue. Honestly, there's so few guns here. It's almost as uh, we could get into the whole gun thing at some point. But it's really interesting how gun laws in this country have evolved. Uh, over the last 30 years, but I'll bore you to death with that another time. Anyway, we're going to move on. Jerry Lawler appears mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on WWE Raw between the ad breaks. So he's not on TV, He, uh, but he was recorded and posted. Jerry Lawler makes a brief appearance on WWE Raw, waving to the crowd with a grey, like a grey bit of stubble. That's the first bit of grey I think I've ever seen on Jerry. Didn't say anything and then left quite soon afterwards, being introduced by Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Raw was in Memphis, so... How mm-hmm. could he not be there if, if he could make it? But uh, what are you thought of Jerry's uh, very brief appearance there? Well, I think Jerry needed that kind of to make him feel just a little bit better. Uh, but there was something about his appearance that was kind of offsetting. It's because he was like, he, he, was, he kept doing this, like he wanted to say something. But I don't know. I, I, I can't. I, I can't pinpoint it. But he still looked pretty good. He's walking. Uh, I hear that his speech was affected by the stroke, and he's taking. He's taking rehabilitation on his speech delivery, and he has gotten better. But a lot of times, they say he's talking. And all of a sudden, he doesn't finish his sentence. You know, is like he's searching for a word. And I do that. Every, well, not every now and then. I do it quite a bit myself. But, and I think he was. Uh, he's much better than what he was. So, uh, my well wishes to you, Jerry. And I hope you come out of this better than you went into it. So, good luck. We will leave Brian Pillman signing for WWNXT for another time. Uh, we, we can talk about Brian when he actually uh, debuts, uh, because I'm absolutely desperate to get to this last bit of news. About a week ago, Hulk Hogan <laughs> uh, gave an interview to Muscle and Health from about a week or so ago. Now, right, so using your fingers and maybe your toes as well, I'm going to read out these few paragraphs... Uh, quotes that he gave to that magazine or website, whatever. And you tell me how many lies you think you hear in it. I've counted, I've counted them as best I can. Lives, uh, lies or very likely tall tales. So I'm going to read it to you. Simon Cowell came to help with the wrestling album. I was in Wembley Stadium. I saw a lot of Make-A-Wish kids. It was me, Michael Jackson... Mr. T. It was all the Make-A-Wish kids during the 80s and 90s. I had a kid there that was in rough shape. The EMTs were with him and he was on the stretcher and, you know, his body odour and stuff, it had a smell to it that I hadn't smelled in a while. Not bad, but it was just a different type of smell. I really wasn't sure where, uh, what it was and the parents were freaking out. The parents were Hulkamaniacs. I told the doctors and EMTs... I was, I was just looking at you when I said that. You know that the kid is in kind of trouble here, you know. Look at, me, look at my face, I'm going. <laughs> yeah, in fact, in fact, I'm going to put the camera on you. Um, so, <laughs> so let me say my goodbyes and give him a hug and a kiss. I got a nice place for him out at ringside at Wembley Stadium and it was all roped off. So I went to wrestle and I kept looking and I kept looking and the kid wasn't there. So when I came back from wrestling, I was the last person to wrestle in the main event. I said, what happened to the family out there? They said the kid passed away. So when I found out the kid passed away, my manager, Jimmy Hart, the Mouse of the South, who used to be in a band too, he had a couple of number one hit songs here in the, uh, in the States, and I played music before, so we stayed up all night and we wrote 12 songs for the kid's family. I didn't know anybody in the UK, and Jimmy knew somebody from Select Records, and they got a hold of Simon Cowell. 
he produced a little album for us and it went to number one on the Billboard charts for eight weeks and we donated the money to the family. Then Simon came back to me and said, we need to do a song with a band called Green, uh, with a band called Green Jelly over in the UK, something called Leader of the Gang, a Gary Glitter song. I should point out at this point that Gary Glitter is one of the most world's most renowned paedophiles. Uh, so that did really well on Billboard too. I came back to the States. I had a crazy idea since I was wrestling. Maybe we should do music here. So I grabbed Cindy Lauper and Rick Derringer and a bunch of people and we recut a bunch of songs, Land of a Thousand Dancers and stuff, and Simon Cal came over and helped produce the wrestling album. Then he came and produced the second wrestling album, Driver, and he never left. He stayed here and he became this monster producer and the nicest guy in the world. So he's also claiming that he brought Simon Cowell over to the United States. Thank you very much, Hulk. So, of that story, what did you think was true? I think very little of it, tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I think is... I mean... The, you're reading that, and he's all over the place. I don't even know what he's talking about. He was talking about Jimmy Hart's musical career and Make-A-Wish Kids and dropping names like a, like a son of a – I don't know. I mean, when you're reading that, I'm going, damn, he did all this? So how many lies are in there? I counted 17. Now, okay, let me, let me say, if if I'm sitting in a car with Hulk and he's telling me all this, listen, I've heard so much bullshit in the wrestling business. <laughs> then eventually, it just when they're hitting you with it, it just rolling off, rolling off, rolling off, you know. I'm not going to say, hey, didn't you do this? But I don't, I don't know. What, so, okay, what is it with Hulk? All right, before I go through every single lie or tall tale in this, are you saying, we, wait a minute, are you saying the Hulk will tell you a lie? I'm saying he's telling me 17 lies in this particular few paragraphs, okay. amazingly. What is it with Hulk Hogan? And just Doesn't he have an interesting enough life that he doesn't have to embellish to this level? I don't get it. You know, there's a lot of things I don't get about wrestling, and this is one of them. So, I mean, wouldn't he have another enough stuff to tell that actually happened? Mm-hmm. Without having to make stuff up? There's so many. Do you know once or he does, claimed... Or, wait a minute, or does he really believe this? Well, you think he's mm. worked himself into a shoot, as they say? <laughs> Maybe. But, I, I, you know, you talk to some guys and they're not there. They're seriously not there anymore. I think Hulk, I hope he is. Because I always liked him. But see, sometimes you have to accept people for what they present to you. And I present, he was he's Hulk. So whatever he says, yeah, whatever. And just go with it. So, But if he's trying to give this to a reporter that wants to fact check this stuff, then they could really embarrass him. Yeah, but there's so many there's so many things he says that are just really easily verifiable. Like one time he said that when he slammed Andre the Giant at WrestleMania three, that was his last match, and he died six days later. It's like he he lived <laughs> six years. You rest. <laughs> no, he did not he say did. that. He's a, you rest. He wrestled in the next WrestleMania a year later. He's just he just comes and up. he says when he slammed him. Andre died six days later. Yeah, he was six tons by that point because Andre started at 500 pounds at the start of the story. And then we're getting into metric yeah, tons by gained, the end of it. Yeah, he probably gained 100 pounds during the match. <laughs> and that's hard to do. But Wait, I, I, have to, I have to go through this paragraph. So, Okay, go ahead. How, how many lies did you count that you thought that's not true? Because I've already told you I've counted 17, but when I read it to you, how many did you think? Nah, probably not. Well, I, I would say at least 10. Okay. so And I forgot, I've forgotten them, but I'm, I'm just throwing that number out there just as a ballpark figure. Simon Cowell came to help with the wrestling album. Uh, he did produce the 1993 Wrestle, uh, WrestleMania album as an executive producer at Stock and Waterman oversaw the project. Hogan did not feature at all on this album, so I don't know where Hogan's story comes in with this. So Hogan then says, I was at Rem Wembley Stadium. No, he wasn't. Uh, it was me, Michael okay, Jackson. Okay, now with WWE or ALF, yep. they've only been to Wembley Stadium once, yes. correct? Yes. 
And Hulk wasn't on that card. He was nowhere that near Summer, that card. That was some. That was SummerSlam, right? Yep. Okay. He was nowhere near that card. Uh, so it was me and Michael Jackson. Now, someone on Reddit very nicely did research and found that Michael Jackson was in Germany at the time during the Dangerous Tour, so he was not at Wembley Stadium. Mr. T was also there, highly unlikely. Why would Mr. T be there in 92? But anyway. And then it was all the Make-A-Wish kids during the 80s and 90s. So every Make-A-Wish kid from the 80s and 90s was at Wembley Stadium that day. Um... The next one I've written is uh, he claimed that uh, the dying child's parents were Hulkamaniacs. Uh, we don't know that. That doesn't, that doesn't even fit. <laughs> no, he just, the story. he just threw that in. Now, don't you don't you know, yeah, the, the kid from the time they had him in the back, he was that close to death. And by the time they going to bring him out there, which they never did, according to Hulk, mm -hmm. he had passed away. Now that's even I got to throw the flag on that one, and I don't even know what he's talking about. I'm glad you mentioned that because he says I got a nice place for this sick kid out at ringside at Wembley Stadium, and it was all roped off. So he also mentioned previously that he was on a stretcher. I mean, he's going to be in an iron lung in the next te retelling of this story. I've never I've never heard or seen a space that big <laughs> left out for an iron lung or similar at ringside. Yes. Make a wish, kid. So I'm, I, I'll use your line there. Throw the flag on that. Then he says, "So I went to wrestle," which he didn't because he wasn't on the card and he wasn't at the show. And then he goes back to the back, and he apparently was looking out for this kid in front row. And then uh, he was like, "Where's the kid?" And then he said, "Oh, the kid died." So like in the space of like an hour. Yeah. So this kid was at death's door okay. for like an hour. Did he supposed to have worked on the show? He's claiming what... he was in the main event of Wembley SummerSlam 1992 in this. Yeah. Well, uh, that didn't happen. I know that. Oh, no, no, that definitely didn't happen. Um, let me just have a look. He claims that Jimmy Hart, uh, Jimmy Hart, Jimmy Hart had a number one hit or a couple of number one hit songs in the States, which is untrue. Keep on Dancing got to number four, although the Gentries did have a few top 40 hits. Um, then he claims that he and Jimmy Hart stayed up all night writing songs for the kids' family. That's it. I have never heard that before. And they wrote 12 songs in 12 hours. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they, at 12 o'clock at night to noon the next day. Hulkster in Heaven oh. was one of them. I mean, if you heard that song, you could believe Hulkster. he wrote it in that five minutes. It's, Huckster in heaven. Yeah, it's like you might you might as well just push dog shit in your ears. It's just awful. I mean, that as a tribute, that's more like a slap in the face to the dead kids' parents. Wait a minute. So there is a song called Huckster in yes, Heaven. Yes, there is. Yes. No, there's not. We can't play it, but there is. Why can't we play it? Because it is copyright. Copy, yes, copyright. Yeah. Oh, where would people, the people that are listening, hey fans, I got you in mind. I want you to hear this song, Hulkster in Heaven. Where would they find that? Oh, just get it on YouTube. It's right there. Hulkster in Heaven. You got to listen to it. Yeah. The old. I mean, you learn, folks, you learn stuff here that you won't hear on any other bullshit podcast. So, but I, I'm, hey, as soon as we finish here, I'm right to Google <laughs> and I'm going to hear Hulkster in Heaven. Yeah. I mean, as I say, it's less how of a far tribute. Did, how, how far did that go up the top 100 charts? Uh, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because... Let me just have a look. <laughs> uh, he produced... Uh, so, uh, doesn't say the song, but he claims that Simon Cowell produced his album. Now, keep in mind that he's talking about the 1992 time frame. This album came out... Actually did come out in 1995 when he was in WCW. I don't think Simon Cowell produced it. I don't think, anyway. Uh, he also claims that the album went to number one on Billboard for eight weeks, which it didn't. It didn't yeah. go there for one week. And uh, apparently he may have done all right on a kid's Billboard uh, uh, album thing. Uh, we donated the money to the family. So we don't know I doubt that. that. I, I doubt that. Yeah, it just said, well, the wrestling album's proceeds came out in 1993. It was a WWF album with no mm -hmm. input from the Hulkster. And those proceeds definitely didn't go. I don't know if the 1995 Hulk Hogan uh, album did. And what have we got else? Uh, yes, Hulk Hogan did, in fact, and I've totally forgotten about this, do a cover of Gary Glitter's 
leader of the gang that reached, in 1993, number 25 on the UK charts. Okay, well, uh, Gary Glitter, I recognize the name. What big hit did he have? It, it was that he had a few, like Rock and Roll Part 2, Leader of the Gang. And then the Gary Glitter story is he was found out that he was a raging old pedo because in back in 1997, when people didn't know that much about computers, he took his computer to be repaired at a local branch of PC World, and, and because it was Gary Glitter, all the staff looked through his hard drive and found thousands of indecent images, and that's how he ended up getting caught. So mm. that really is his lasting legacy. Uh, anyway. Is, I mean, he still, is, is he still living? Sadly, he is, yes. In fact, I think he's at large at the moment. He was recently released from prison. Hmm. Paul Gadd is his real now, name. Now, Gary Glitter, that, that would be a name most of the people, I would think, uh, wouldn't be they wouldn't they wouldn't know him. Mm. I knew him because of that one big hit, Gary Glitter. Yeah. Pretty good, good song for the times, but but he was a pedophile. Oh yeah, committed, a raging, pedophile. raging pe pedophile. Yes, and he's not just a pedophile. No, no, no. He's no. a he's raging. In, he's a raging pedophile. He's bought into uh, the ideal ideology of pedophilia. So he is. And uh, probably still is as well. Uh, anyway, uh, we have three more lies here. Uh, he then claims that Cindy, he grabbed Cindy Lauper and Rick Derringer to make uh, a bunch of songs and help produce the wrestling album. Simon Cowell helped produce the wrestling album. He's conflating this with seven years earlier with the wrestling album, uh, which came out in 1985, and Simon Cowell was nowhere near that. And then he also says uh, that uh, Simon Cowell dealt with Pile Driver, which is the follow-up to the wrestling album, which came out in 1987, five years before all this should have happened. And then he also claims that he brought Simon Cowell to America. 17. Dubious, dubious uh, tales or, outli or outli outright lies. Well, it doesn't surprise me. But see, I would, I would have never. See, folks, this is why I have James here. He would check the, the facts on stuff. I would have never checked. If he just, like I said before, if I'd been sitting in the car and we'd going down the road, and, let me tell you, brother, you know about Gary Glitter. <laughs> I would just take. I would actually the conversation would have started in the car, and I would have left it in the car. I wouldn't have got out of the car and I said, or told anybody, "Hey, Hook told me he did this with Gary Glitter." Because he, he would go in one ear of my head and out the other one, so. But see, in the wrestling business, you get used to that. You cannot li You have to naturally assume anything anybody tells you. Well, not anybody, but guys like Hulk, and I like Hulk, but whatever he tells you, that is kind of bullshit to begin with. So never get out and quote what Hulk says because – you know, chances are that most of it is, is just made up. Funny. So he ta he told a story about his wife, uh, or, no, a guy's wife, Bubba the Love Sponge, oh, yeah. that his wife wanted to go to bed with Hulk, and they did. Then they taped it, and then um, Bubba turned it back on him uh, what a messed up deal they had. Did you read that? You ever read the deal? Are you joking? I've, I've watched a documentary on it. It was a terrible documentary as well. But uh, yeah, the Gorka trial. Very interesting. Yeah. Because it had wider implications on journalism as well. Mm hmm. Well, let me. Bubba, he made Bubba, really. Bubba, I guess, was a, a shock jock back in those days. Shit jock. In, Awful. It, Were you there when Awesome Kong slapped the crap out of him? No, I heard about it. Uh, awesome Kong should have slapped the crap out of him. Uh, you know, she's making a comeback. She's making she a... She is. Yeah. She's showing up with TNA, and I'm glad for her because she's the one who really turned women's wrestling around. Dutch, I I hate to do this to you because normally I know this is more of a rambling thing. We are going to talk about that next week or the week after when they have the match. Okay. We, we, we'll leave Awesome Kong there because Gail Kim is returning as well. But we will leave that. I, I want to mention one more thing about this and then we're going to have to move on. On Theo Von's podcast very recently, Hulk Hogan then refutes his own horseshit claims 
about being there at Wembley with Michael Jackson because he says, and this is quote, the only time I've met Michael Jackson was when they made us move down the bus and got and get out of the way. I don't think they, they want us to look at him or anything, but he came down and apologised. So apparently the only time he's ever actually seen Michael Jackson was he shared a bus with him once. I don't get it. Well, they ask him to move? Yeah, security. On, on a bus? Yeah, apparently on security bus? asked Hulk Hogan and his family to shift over so Michael Jackson could walk past. What kind of bus? A big one. Must have been. I guess so. Well, anyway. <laughs> right. Let's... It's Hulk, so take it take it for what it's worth. Uh, All right, Hulk. I think we've had enough of you. Yeah, right. I, I was actually going to move on to the main event, actually, but I'm going to say one more bit of news, and I completely forgot to mention it. Tyrus retires. Now, yes, Tyrus, formerly known as Brodus Clay, said he would retire if he lost the NWA world title to EC3 at the NWA 75th anniversary show, which he indeed lost in a bull rope match. Quote, it's bittersweet, George Tyrus Murdoch said of his retirement Tuesday on Fox and Friends. It's a happy time. These are happy tears. It was the right decision and it was time. To be a great wrestler, you got to go 300 days a year. you got to train. you got to do those things. The NWA is growing. They've got live events now and they're doing all these things. My job was to promote and I was the NWA champion. It's a small list. They can never take that away from me, Tyra said. It ju- it was just time, and I talked to my family about it. My kids voted and said, that's one last weekend that Daddy's gone, and it was unanimous. So the retirement of Tyrus. Mm-hmm. Tyrus a good guy. I watch him a lot on uh, the Gutfeld show, and it's a, it's, it's a new show, but it's not a new show. It's like me and you sitting here talking about the news. We're making fun of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and they're conservatives, so a lot of liberals, they wouldn't like to watch this show. But Tyrus is a very smart guy. You can listen to him, and he's very funny. He's got a, he's very humorous. And, uh, but I, I, I like him a lot. So uh, he made, a, I think he made a comment in there that wasn't entirely true. 300 days a year. Wrestlers don't go 300 days a year now. In WWE, they may go, what is what is uh, 50 times 3? 150? 150, and then there's yeah. you know, some travel days in there as well. So call it yeah. 180. Yeah. We used to go over one year, I went 300, I think, in 20-some days. We were running seven days a week. This was in the Mid-South. And double headers on Saturday and Sunday. So some weeks I would have as many as maybe 10 live matches and you were busting your ass in every one of those matches today in, in, in WWE, they may go 160, 170, but they don't work that many days. They don't have to get in the ring. They may go there, but they don't actually wrestle. And AEW does less than that. So, well, see, well, they make their money now. They make their money now off TV. Totally. Mm-hmm. It's like TV contracts, international contracts. That's how they make their money. So the house show making money, uh, living on that model doesn't exist anymore. You still get paid for it, but... See how WWE pays. Say they give a $500,000 downside guarantee. Well, all your merchandising goes in that too. Anything you do outside, they can send you anywhere and they get the money for it. So they're paying you by having you do all this extra stuff. WrestleMania week is one of their biggest weeks ever uh, because of the, they, they send you out to tables you're signing this, you're signing that, you're taking pictures, you're doing this. Nobody has any time off during WrestleMania week. Uh, some of the guys, like bottom guys, like first and second match, but they still make them work too. So they're earning their money. So what were you going to say? Uh, have a guess how many matches Tyrus has had in 2023. 20. 11. What's he doing on the road that's 300 days a year? Crikey. <laughs> he'd barely no, what he's doing uh, on, on, on the Gutfeld show, what he does, he sits out there with this uh, with the NWA title over his shoulder, sits there the whole show. 
So Billy Corgan's got to love that. Mm. And Gutfeld has to be a hell of a wrestling fan to have him sit out there. And I don't know how they met, but I think uh, Tyrus, he may have pulled security for him one time and he, they met somehow. But he, he uh, Gutfeld really likes Tyrus or he wouldn't be on the show. Mm. So, and he sits out there the whole show. It runs five days a week. So no telling how many times that belt has been, has been featured. It's over Tyrus' shoulder. But last week, unfortunately, I looked and I didn't know he had lost the title. The title wasn't there. Oh. So, and, and they bring it up, but he is actually, uh, I, I saw his last match. He, you know, he's 50 years old and he weighs 350 pounds, 370 pounds. And what I was worried about Tyrus is his knees going out. Uh, he's not going, he's not going to get hurt with a, a back injury and thing. Cause he don't really, he, he don't really go down, but he's like one of those guys, like big daddy in England, mm-hmm. you know, you didn't see him flying all over the ring. Did you No. Did you ever see him? Now, folks, Big Daddy was a huge star in the UK, correct? In the most literal of senses, as well as uh, famous. He was, he was a, a big, fat, unathletic guy that somehow just ended up being... He was actually the brother of the promoter. And uh, look, <laughs> seriously, uh, like as big as Hulk Hogan was in the US, Big Daddy was as big here. He was okay, He was a household but, name. But British wrestling used to draw big time, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, un- until and, supposedly and Big Daddy helped kill it off because I think people got a bit sick of him in the end. Well, this is what I heard, and tell me if I'm right or not, that the BBC kicked wrestling off. Nope. It was never on BBC. They didn't? No, it was on ITV. You you calling me a liar? Okay, uh, ITV. Yeah. ITV. They kicked it off. Yeah. The because reason- they considered it low class. Yeah, the, well, the, the messed around with the formula in 86, they started letting... It wasn't always British wrestling. Occasionally, he started letting WWF wrestling get in '86, and then they changed the time on it. So I think it started showing a lot earlier. So people who were working half days in the factories on Saturday couldn't get back in time to watch it because, let's say, it began at 11 a.m. instead of 4 p.m. or something like that. So do 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 a monkeying with the formula on purpose to then have an excuse to take it off ITV completely, and it did. Uh, was so in, in '88. Those bastages. Yep. You know, when I when I first realized, hey, I didn't even know they had wrestling in the UK until I met John Foley. He was an old time wrestler over there. And all of a sudden I started seeing all these English guys, British guys popping up in the States. And then I asked them, like Tony Charles was one of them. Uh, Foley, uh, Regal, uh, a, f- a few more. And I asked them, I said, what happened? They said, well, it's, it's dead over there. You can't, you can't make any money over there. You never and could. so they left. It was always cheap. It, do, do you know how much they were paying Dynamite Kid um, per match? This is in the late 70s. So adjusted for inflation, fine. But do you know how yeah. much they were paying Dynamite Kid per match? And I'll do it in dollars. Have a guess. $25. $25. 15 About $15 a match. And he was working every really? day. Yeah, so he'd probably make, in the States, in let's say 79 or 78 or 77 or whatever it is, he would have been making $100 a week or less. But then they used to have, they used to book matches at these, like people would pull their trailer parks in and they'd go on vacation they would have matches there no that's like the, germany the, you're thinking of you know the tent tours that might be that they didn't do that in in england no 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 it was always a traveling okay. affair in england whereas in germany and austria and you know frotto vance you'd go there mm-hmm. and stay in the same place for six weeks and you'd be in the static caravans and i never understood that either how could you draw for six weeks well they did the tournaments and stuff so i think it was maybe a bit like like arena mexico where the uh-huh. maybe it's something like that where they have some in I mean, they run the same arena like every week I think there yeah. still and they I still thought they ran it. every night yeah. I thought they ran every night do they run every night there that's what I thought Crikey. but but it's, hey. it's a big tourist place as well okay but so yeah there's a lot of tourists who go there as well anyway we're we're gonna leave arena Mexico because I want who to get- was the announcer who was the announcer on the British shows Ken Walton he was very good. 
He was I great. I liked him. Yeah. And I liked the way they did it because they would do a move. Now, like if you do it in, in the U.S., oh, he did this. Well, hell, I know what he did. <laughs> I saw it the same time you did. But Ken Walton, you say his name, mm -hmm. he would let it breathe. Now, I've said this before. And you would, if it was a great move, you know, you'd be sitting there, well, I, I really like that. And then the announcer would come in. He said, now nah, the strategy is, and he would tell you what kind of strategy the guy would have. But it fit the match. And I liked it better that you didn't drown out the action with a lot of words that meant nothing like you see on WWE all the time. He, uh, I misspoke slightly. He's Kent Walter, not Ken. Uh, are you ready for the meat of our show now? Even though we haven't got that much time, we're going to do it. Uh, we are going to be talking about the greatest wrestlers to never be world champion. I just need to pause one second. Okay. Okay, sorry, we had to go away for a couple of minutes. I had to explain in great detail the sort of the game that we're about to do. But I'll give you the very short version, people at home. Now, I made a post on YouTube about five days ago and on the YouTube community board, and I threw out a little question for you. I said, uh, who was the best wrestler ever or best wrestlers ever that was never world champion? Never world champion as a recognized world championship that we would recognize as a world championship. And I thought, okay, oh, that, that would that mean regional championships? Regional World championships champion. don't count. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so we'll we'll argue over what constitutes a heavyweight championship. I'm sure. In fact, I've got a question that I just need to write down. I'll ask that. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to give you a list of names. We got 350 odd responses, and some of these people wrote one name. Some of these people wrote. 10 or more names. So every single time a name came up, I gave mm -hmm. it a one. And of all the people who were named, I'm now yep. going to tell you the people who got one name mention. I'm going to speed through these and then we'll do two and three and then we'll get into the meat of it from four name mentions. So the people that got one vote, say one vote. Essentially one vote. What do you want me to do? Just hear the nothing. name? And yeah, yeah, nothing. nothing. I will just nothing. speed through them. Okay, good. <clears throat> the one vote people are Billy Jack Haynes, Tony Atlas, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, Mark Mero, Billy Robinson, Dick Murdoch, Rick Steiner, Jesse Ventura, Sean Waltman, Pack slash Neville, Mr. Kennedy, Abdullah the Butcher, Jimmy Garvin, Carl Gotch, uh, several mentions of Rick Martell, but he was AWA world champion, so he's disqualified. Many mentions of Kurt Hennig, he was AWA world champion, he doesn't count, and neither does Jerry Lawler, but no one mentioned Jerry Lawler for some reason. Uh, where are we now? Excuse me. Rocky Johnson, Cesaro, Ring of Honor doesn't count. D'Lo Brown, Kevin Sullivan, Ernie Ladd, Mark Lewin, Johnny Valentine, George the Animal Steel, Haku, Umaga, J Samoa Joe, if you don't count the TNA title. Uh, Warlord, Barbarian, Hillbilly Jim, Kamala Earthquake, Al Tomko, Miguel Perez Jr., Savio Vega, Hector Guerrero, somebody said, Val Venus, Bob Armstrong, Manny Fernandez, Terry Gordy, although he was an All Japan Triple Crown champion twice, so I think that does count, Adrian Street, Carlito, LA Knight, and Chris Masters. Now, I'm sorry I'm speeding through these, everybody, because there's a lot of names to mention. Uh, people who got two votes, Hercules Hernandez, Bam Bam Bigelow, J Big John Studd, Matt Hardy, who's TNA champion, but I don't think that counts at the time. Buddy Rose, Chris Adams, Eugene, two people said Eugene, two people said Doink the Clown, Barry Windham, if we're not counting the NWA international title. One Man Gang, Buddy Landell, Dutch Mantel was mentioned twice. Really? Yes. Buddy, uh, Bubby. B Bubby. Well, hey, I, hey, voted, Bubby. I voted more times than that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I tried to say Bobby, but I said Bubby. Hey, Bubby. Bo uh, Bobby Roode. <laughs> Shelton Benjamin and Tatanka. And now we're getting into the meat here slightly more. Three name mentionees. Beautiful Bobby Eaton, Mass Superstar, Billy E.D., King Kong Bundy, Bad News Brown, Jim Duggan, Brad Armstrong, Greg Valentine, Gino Hernandez, Ken Shamrock, Junkyard Dog, David Von Eric, Bob Orton Jr. and Robert Fuller. Any of those names that I've read out there do you think belong in the top five wrestlers who have never won a world title? I know I rattled them off quickly. Did I name myself? No. Oh, okay. So uh, just, I know. would say, hey, Bob Morton Jr. probably. Okay. Do you want to write that down on your list then? Because ultimately, but I'm going to read all yeah. these names out, and you are going to pick the top five of all time, never to win a world title. Now, you can write down more than five of them, and then we'll whittle it down from there. Okay. 
I so, can write down any name. You can write down any qualifying name, yeah. And then you can write down 20 names, then we can work it out from there. Now, of the four name mentiony votes, Tully Blanchard, Nikita Koloff, My Man Don Morocco, and Ray the Crippler Stevens. Any of those? Yep. Ray Stevens. Did you ever meet Ray Stevens? I never met him. I never met him, but he was good enough to do it. Okay. People who got five votes, only two. Tito Santana and Bruiser Brody. Now, we've uh, talked many, many times about Bruiser Brody. Did you ever meet Tito? Uh, I met him once, I think. Okay, so no major great stories then coming from Tito, I imagine. No. And, and Brody, I have stories, but we've talked about those. Yeah. Does Bro uh, Brody or Tito make it on the list? Uh, Brody could make it, but temperament, I don't think he could. He could, you know, being a champion, you got to put a lot of politics in it. Mm -hmm. And Brody was not very seasoned on politicking. Mm -hmm. The six name mentionees, people who got six votes, only two again. Wahoo McDaniel and Butch Reed. Now, we've talked about Wahoo before, but uh, I don't think I've ever asked you about Butch Reed, or if I have, I've forgotten. You, was he in Mid-South at the time you were there? Yes, he was. Good guy. Uh, I did see him, and I may have told this story before. You'll tell me if I have. I will do, yeah. He got into it with... John Nord, you've told this one. <laughs> I told this one. And yeah. when when Bill Watts pulled him in the back and he said, hey, if you got to settle something, he said, do it right here. And nobody was in the room. And they threw down. And I was, I was, I was riding with Nord almost during that, his whole period there. And we would ride together. It's hilarious. Mm. And he told me the story, um, and you need to get in touch with him. I think we could have him on. Apparently. I can't. I don't. I don't know where he is. Is he on Facebook? I don't think so. Somebody tell us how to get in touch with John Nord in the comments, if you would. I'm hoping he's on Facebook. I'll try and answer. Yeah, tell him I'm looking for him. Yeah. Right. Of the uh, people who got seven votes, there are three: Davy Boy Smith, Gold Dust. Now, I want to bring this up very briefly. Is that? Everyone apart from one person referred to him as Gold Dust, not Dustin Runnels or Rhodes mm -hmm. or anything, which I just find fascinating that that's. I mean, everyone wow. remembers because he was the most interesting as Gold Dust. Mm -hmm. Dustin Rhodes was not interesting. He's not just being a son of Dusty. You know, Dusty and and Dustin, they didn't always see eye to eye on things. Especially when I think when Dustin married that first girl he married, I don't think Dusty approved of her much. But uh, but he was more interesting as Goldust, and he hated the angle. Did he really? He hated. Oh, he hated the character when he got it, and then I think he got somebody told him, "Oh, listen, why don't you take it and run with it." To make it as damn, you know, over the top as you can. And he says, and then now he was challenged because they didn't want Dustin anymore. So he either did go dust or he went home, I guess. And you saw what they did, did with go dust. People responded to that. It's not because he did it so well. And Mr. Goldust would have been an excellent champion. I'm glad you said that, because I actually think you're right there. I think they could have done a lot with that. I don't think it would have been... I agree with you most of the time. It's, for people, people didn't see the face that Dutch just made at me, that, like that. <laughs> <laughs> you agreed with yeah. me? I do, I do uh, agree with you. I think uh, he would have he, driven off advertisers, but I think he would have been a really interesting champion. Uh, he would have been. Because he he took that character and he made it, he took ownership of it, and he got it over. Because a lot of guys, they don't want any kind of a 
They didn't want any kind of a, a gimmick outside of what they felt comfortable with. And even though Dustin didn't feel comfortable with it at first, then he went out there. Then he saw how the people responded. Then he says, hey, I can really do something with this. And he took it and he ran with it. And I really, I, I was a big fan of Go Dust. Do you? I have a pic. I have a picture of him and I, and I'll send it to you so we we might play it on the show next week. Yeah, please. I, I'm sitting there, and Go Dust, his head is right here looking at me, and he's all painted up. So this is when we're in the back messing around. I see if I can find that picture and send it to you. Did you ever hear the story? Uh, in fact, I've got two more things about Goldust I want to ask you. One, did you ever hear the story that he was possibly going to get booby implants as gold dust? I think I heard that, but I don't think he would went that far with it. Uh, it may have been a Russo, it may have been a Russo idea. <laughs> well, I know hey, you're shocked. No, I'm not shocked really because. <laughs> The wrestling business doesn't shock me at all because if if Vince had insisted on it, guess what? He'd have been running around with some boobies. That's <laughs> what he'd have been running. <laughs> and then as soon as he would quit, he quit wrestling for WWE, he probably had them removed. But, you know, you know, you have a bad scar right here. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if people want that. But where did you hear this, that he, they had, considered boobies for gold dust no a big heaving set of bosoms on gold dust i i may have actually Who's been it? it may have been Dustin, or it may have been russo who said that and it was not far from ha actually being put into practice yeah i i don't know if dustin would go as far as to to mangle his own body to get that gimmick over but it sounds like something a wrestler like Russo, uh, somebody like Russo would come up with. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Do you know of anybody who refused to work with Goldust because of the uh, type of character that he played? No. Wrestlers don't do that. I mean, apparently Scott last, Hall did. Apparently Scott Hall wasn't comfortable with it. He didn't want to work with Goldust. Yeah. He may not have. He, he, but uh, this is, well, if he had made a big stink about it, I would have heard something about it. But you know, Dustin would go to him and say, "Brother, it's a gimmick. What is wrong with you? Are you a mark? <laughs> Are we trying to make this is a business? It's called pro. It means you get paid. This is pro wrestling. So he never worked with Scott Hall. He did briefly, and I think Razor." As Razor Ramon, he told himself out of it. No, I can't believe Razor Ramon doing that. Razor Ramon, he was he was weird too in his own particular way. I mean, not weird in a bad way, but I don't think he would have considered working with with Gold Dust beneath him at all. Now, uh, the last maybe uh, are you sure Hulk Hogan didn't have something to do? <laughs> he didn't come up with a go go dust idea. That's what I heard he said. Well, Hulk Hogan, I know one night went home with Jimmy Hart and wrote 12 songs about him and then released an album that Simon Cowell produced in 1998. He went on the Billboard charts for eight weeks, wouldn't you believe, Dutch? <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. Uh, and the last of the seven voted wrestlers is William Regal. Uh-huh. Okay. 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 We've got a write down for that one. Now, next, we've got a couple who were voted eight times Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Mm-hmm. Does that sound right to you? I mean, you couldn't trust him with the belt, for Christ's sake, especially in the 80s, but he was over like Rose. Uh, okay, you're talking about good material for a world champion. Mm. He, prob he probably had it, but I don't think he had the personality for it. And the other one who was voted eight times, double A, Arn Anderson. He did. Okay, we've not really we've not really talked about Arn Anderson on this show very much, and I know you're a big fan of Arn. So, if you've got a good story or two about Arn, what better time than to say them now? Well, some of my stories about Arn aren't releasable. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you at least redact some names like Arn Andersons? Well, just say somebody. 
I do have the story that he told me about the night he got stabbed. Okay. So it was, uh, I forgot what had happened. I, I'd have to go over this. But they were in a bar, and they were drinking. Sid was in there. And something was said at the bar that apparently upset Sid. I think they were in the UK, too. Yes. Were they in the UK? They were, yeah. Yeah. So they went back to the room, and Arn said he was... He'd been in his room 30 minutes or whatever he was in. Then he had a knock at the door. There was Sid, and Sid had a pair of scissors. This is this has been documented. Mm -hmm. And they had words, and I think they got into a tussle, and Arn got stabbed several times, I think. Mm-hmm. How many times did he get cut, stabbed? I don't know how many times he got cut. It, it was several. I believe the story is, is that Vader ended up sticking his finger in one of the wounds to you know, clot it, basically. Uh, I think this was in 1993, WCW yeah. tour. And that was one of the wildest stories I'd ever heard in wrestling, except for the Bruiser Brody story. Because you just don't, I mean, you can't imagine that happening, but it did. And I don't know. When did Sid leave WCW? Uh, in 1993. <laughs> he was fired. Is that when it, when, it, when it happened? Yeah, he was, he was fired over it, yeah. Okay, when he broke his leg, where was he? WCW 2000, early. No, oh, I'm sorry. It was like January 2001, I think. So this happened in 93. Mm -hmm. Then he went to WWF. Mm -hmm. Then he ended up going back to WCW mm -hmm. and then ended up suing them for breaking his leg. Yes. How much money did he get out of that? We should have him on and ask him one day. I think it was considerable because it was documented that Johnny Ace or the higher ups were insisting he do it. And Sid kept saying, I don't want to do this because I'll get hurt. And he was right. So they were totally liable for it. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I keep seeing it by accident, and you know me, I, I'm really oh, squeamish about stuff, but God, that's horrific. I, I can't I can't watch it. I can't watch it. Why would I, I want to, to watch it? That's right. I don't have to watch it, do I? No. I can't watch it. <laughs> no, but the first time I saw it, it's like you can't unsee it. Yeah. Oh, it, it went like 90 degrees. Oh, my God. I hate to even think of that, but. I heard he got like uh, two to three million dollars, hmm. and that was quite a fair sum back in the day. It still is now. Yeah, it is. Well, not making a but. <laughs> I made that off WrestleMania one time, two million dollars. <laughs> yeah, I well, made. I you, made. You I wrestled made, with really, Hulk Hogan in the main event. I did. I did, and I made sure that I made one dollar more than he did. <laughs> or I was I was I was gonna walk out. And oh, Vince reminds. pushed a hard bargain, but I said that's it, buddy. I called him pal. I, I said, pal, you take it or you don't take it. I gotta make one dollar more than Hogan. I remember you bought and, and, and I want you to pick up the phone and call Sidney Lauper and tell him. <laughs> I remember you body slammed Hulk Hogan. He was three tons at the time. He slammed him, got the big pin. He died six yep. days later. He resurrected he himself shortly after that for a comeback. See, you didn't know this stuff. No. Seriously, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> but he did. But uh, Okay, wanna, who's the last name I got? Uh, Arn Anderson's Double last name. I, I want to talk Double about Arn Anderson more. Obviously, you said there's some certain stories that you can't say on air. Can you talk or uh, testify to how good of a worker Arn is? Because everyone in the business extols the virtues. Do you like the word? Uh, of good, Arn Anderson. Extols. I love that. Mm -hmm. Arn, Arn had, he, he had good moves. He looked the part. He got lucky, though, when they put that Anderson name on him. Because that was like giving him a copyright. That's giving him a trademark. 
became an Anderson with Ole and Gene, which if you're a mid-Atlantic uh, fan, the Anderson brothers were a like a trademark name. So to say Arn was their brother, and he was their brother, right? Mm-hmm. Not their cousin. He was their brother. Yeah. Plastic brothers, so, as you say. So he stepped right into it. And I don't know whose idea it was to make him an Anderson. I think it may have been Gene, uh, because Gene was a little bit older and he wanted to, maybe he wanted, and, and Ole wanted to, to keep going. So they put Arn with him. They look alike and a great worker. But more than a great worker, he had two other attributes that you like that word attributes. He had two other uh, skills uh, highly sought after is he had timing, great timing. And he was one hell of an interview. Because when you listen to Arn, you didn't listen to bullshit. You listen to a guy and if he was talking to you on the street, you'd believe him. And Arn played the part and acted the part, performed the part, so actually, I, I think Marty, what's his name, Lundy, Marty Lundy, mm-hmm. he morphed into uh, Arn Anderson, and I think Arn probably took over the Marty Lundy uh, personality, and he was he was uh, from there on out he was he was an Anderson. The next name we have on our list with nine votes, Magnum T A. Now, uh, we pretty much know he was groomed for the world title and then uh, he ended up in the car wreck. Um, yep. we've, we've talked about Magnum quite recently, so we'll skip a story on Magnum. Now, the next name, we've got quite a jump here to Crikey. I've actually got this uh, the wrong way around. What did you ne- say? Crikey? Crikey. Not, it doesn't matter. Uh, crikey. Crikey. I've, I've mixed these up, uh, but I'm going to say this one first because it's in the order of. With 18 name checks, with 18 votes... Owen Hart. That's it. That's all I got. That's it. Uh, no, I don't think so. Why not? I, I would think Owen was what? How tall was he? Realistically, about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, I think the size more than anything else. And I don't know, how was he on interviews? I never heard him do a lot of interviews. He was, and some people are going to... And keep in mind, I'm, look, I've am i written this book on Owen. I mean, I like to think of myself as one of the better read people on Owen Oh, Hart's so you, Oh, wait a minute. You you can't even put his name in there, then. You're biased. I wouldn't I wouldn't put Owen's name in the top five. No, we just named the top five. Well, we, we, we're going to get all the names we think should be on the list, okay, and then okay, we'll whittle okay. it down from there. But I, I wouldn't put Owen in the top five people. Uh, Owen, on interviews, was sometimes good. Was sometimes he was he was a bit hit and miss on interviews. He was the mm-hmm. best when he was the really spoiled brat that would always take digs at Brett. That's when he mm-hmm. really shone, and he and he was really good in that role. But mm-hmm. some people said Owen had more charisma. I Brett had more charisma. I think that's uh, he was a lot more funnier. Owen was definitely me. funnier. Oh, uh, he was hilarious. Did he ever rip you? One of the no, but one of the cheapest guys in wrestling. Mm-hmm. He was up Mick Foley cheap, and that's cheap, cheap. Sometimes he would go on the road, not spend one dime on the road, and would come back. I've told you this. Are you doing your deal that I've told the story before? No, I was just listening. No, he would go on the road, and he would have fans. Oh, yeah, we have to. Pick him up at the airport, take him around, take him to their house, their houses, for him to stay there, buy his food, buy his beer or whatever, and do whatever that he wanted to do. They'd pay for it. Sometimes he would go home, say he left with $100 in his pocket. He'd come back with 120 He wouldn't spend one dime on the road because the fans picked it up. Mm-hmm. And he made he, – he loved that. And guess what? The fans loved it because to them, the fans, they were his friends. 
they they became his friends, not necessarily fans. And uh, he would tell them, "Hey, can you pick me up wherever in St. Louis?" And, yeah, I can pick you up. They would take time off work to to go be with go be with Owen. Yeah, but they loved it. I mean, they got and, something out of it. And the, and and the th- oh yeah, they did. They got to they got to hang around with Owen and. But you know, I never heard of Owen having any any female friends. These are all guys, I guess. So I never heard of him messing around or anything, which is kind of rare for a wrestler on the road. So we will so move. I'll leave that. I'll leave that where it is. Yeah, no, yeah, we'll leave that where it is. Uh, the next <laughs> one, and I actually mixed all these with seventeen votes. Now we are. We're not going to count the NWA international title because that was a short-lived uh, belt for a couple of years in WCW that was meant had to be it. Ric Flair, Steamboat, and uh, a couple of other people, and uh, maybe, and our next name, Rick Rude. Yes. There you go. We have not talked about Rude many times on the show, I don't, care. Uh, I don't think so. Where was the first time you met him? Was it in Memphis? In Memphis, he came in. He had a valet. I forgot what her name was. Greener, he's. I think he was direct from Minneapolis, the Minnesota territory. Mm-hmm. And he came in, and I, I, I look at him, and this guy here is like 210, 215, two, at the most 220, but he was tall. And he was in shape. And I find out later he was the toughest one of all of them that came out of Minnesota. He could whip all their asses. The road warriors shied away from him. They didn't want to have nothing to do with him. Vader would stay away from him because what they said he had, he had like a a punch. When he, if he straightened a punch out on you, forget it. You, you're going down. You're going to stay down for the count. They had a lot of respect for him. And I mean, Nikita Koloff stayed away from him. Name somebody else from Minnesota. Oh, God. Powers of Pain. I don't know if they were from Warlord, maybe. They, yeah, remember. Warlord Kurt, was there. Kurt Hennig was, I know that. But. And Kurt Henning, you know, Kurt Henning, he, he wouldn't, no, anybody could get mad at Kurt. You know, that's, that's, he went out of his way to make people like him. So, but nobody, and these are the guys uh, telling me are from Minnesota. They said he was the toughest one of all of them. That if they were in a bar and they want to have a, a a deal, an argument would spill to the street. Well, then Rick would kind of put himself in the lead role, even if he didn't even start the argument. And he'd go out and he'd knock the guy out, bam, and then it'd be over, and then they all go back in and they start drinking again. That's how, and he was respected. What, what was, was what was Rick like personally? Because oh, he was good. He was great. Yeah, kind of funny. Not not super funny, but when he he had to get to know you first. So the first first time I met him, he was like, because I'm the veteran. Oh, he could have beat the dog shit out of me if he wanted to. I just didn't. But out of respect, he listened to me. And I saw early on, I, this guy's got it. This guy don't have to do nothing. And then the gimmick, and they put him with uh, Bobby Heenan. Didn't they put him with Heenan as a manager? Yeah, in 87 they did. Yeah, in WWF. And he had... Up to that point, he had girlfriends, like managing him. But one of his best gimmicks or angles he ever did was with Jake the Snake. Because Jake the Snake said something about his, no, I think Rude said something about Jake the Snake's wife. Mm -hmm. And remember that he pulled it off and he had to, he had her face on his crotch on his tights oh and then here comes jake and and the, they released a story they told him not to go everybody told him not to go don't go don't go don't go even vince told him no we don't need you to go according to to jake 
he went against all instructions, which I don't believe. Why would the camera still be there? Mm. <laughs> but he, he said, no, they all told him, don't go, don't go. He said, well, if I don't go, that's going to make me look like, and he was right. So when he went, people responded. So, and they, they hit a hell of a run. You know, a name you did leave out in this. Well, was, was, are you not? No, doing no, no, no. You just, you okay. just hold onto your hat okay. there. For, just before we move on to our next name, that uh, we've got a few left, definitely. Uh, did you ever wrestle Rick? Oh, yeah. But he was, he was, he was in the learning stages. Well, that's, so what I wanna, that's what I want to get out of you, actually, is how do you wrestle someone who's got that kind of potential? But how would the greenness show through if, when you were trying to wrestle him and sort of lead him through a match? He was hesitant to do certain things because he didn't want to look as though he wanted to take over more than he was he was ready to do. And so I just talked him through this stuff. and. And then he got to to the point to where he, he trusted me and see what a lot of guys don't understand about wrestling, even guys in it say that he was going to, we were trying to get him over in Memphis. So we had to beat somebody. So I was a designated jobber guy that week on uh, just around the house loop. Mm. So so if I'm going to get beat, guess what it's going to take to beat me? The guy's got to be pretty tough. So I have to make him pretty tough in the lead up to him pinning me. So in the fan's eyes, well, hey, that damn rude guy's pretty tough. You know, he gave Dutch a run for his money. So I don't want him to look weak. I want him to look strong. So at the end, you know, his he was a lot better than what, I imagined him to be, and he beat me. So, so I had to make him look. I had to make him look good, look strong, look capable, uh, and look like a threat or a force, because we knew where he was going. He was going to Lawler, <laughs> so we got to build him up up the ladder to where he got to Lawler. Did he draw? He did. He wasn't there long. But he was probably there six months, eight months. It's a learning period. Mm. But in learning, we brought him up the ladder. Memphis was really, really good at teaching guys the ropes, teaching them how to how to get over in certain situations. And the people who were putting him over, we understood it too. See, we have to understand it more than the guy we're putting over. Because we're the ones, see, he was so green, he couldn't lead a match. So we had to lead him and make him look tougher than what he actually envisioned himself being. See, what he would have done left to his own uh, his own uh, machinery is to go out there and just put us over the whole time, then beat us. Well, we need to make him look tough. So... If you see in a boxing match and this guy's going in there and he's a champion, but this other guy's hanging with him, well, damn, he's pretty damn tough. Whether he wins or not, he at least gets respect from the fans. So that's that, that was what my job was, and I did my job. I hope I did because he got over. So number five on the list with 21 votes was... Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, uh, he makes the list, I presume. So why does he make the list? Uh, Paul Orndorff does make the list and pretty high on the list because he was a great performer and a, gr a good talker. And when he finished talking on TV, he kind of left an impression on you. And... Uh, and you could tell the, of course, it's not up to me. I, I, I like this word, the arbiter. I'm not the, I'm not the just judge on whether he gets over or not. That's the fans. But I'm saying me listening to him, I like to listen to him. And uh, because I took him seriously, because that's what his interview would do. You would take him seriously. And by taking him seriously, 
it meant one thing. He was a serious guy. He was a really, uh, if, if he stepped out of that ring and had to get into a, a real tussle, he was a, he was a tough guy. And very few guys on the street would hang with him. I'll say that. Now, uh, if, if any at all, really. Now, his nickname was Oscar the Grouch. Was he one of the grumpier wrestlers that you were around in your time? No. I think that was his gimmick in, in, uh, in, back in the dressing room. <laughs> but, but I never saw him that way. He was always, always up and, and friendly to me. So... We shall move on to number four. Our old friend, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, with 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 32, 32 votes, 32 name checks in our little community board thing. I see you writing down Ted's name already. Yep. So we've talked a lot about, you know, his recent legal trouble. We'll leave that out for now. Or, you know, until, you know, there's a development. I was going to say, that. he'd make a great world champion if <laughs> <laughs> if you get him out of jail. Yeah, if he was at large. No, uh, I don't think he's going to jail. No, but... well, you, uh, probably not. But uh, Ted DiBiase, what would make him a great world champion? And before you actually say, I want to make mention of this, that Ric Flair won over uh, the, uh, he won the NWA championship in 1981 over Ted DiBiase in 1981 by one vote from the NWA board of directors. So one vote either way, and it could have been Ted who was champion instead. Well, I like Ted. I think he would have been a great, great champion uh, because he had the work. He had great, great timing, a good talker. Plus he was about six, four. He was a, he was a big guy. So and when DBS stepped into the ring, he was, you could tell that he was, he was skilled at what he did and he could make you believe I'm a, I'm a, always a big Ted DBS fan. We're going to go for number three, Jake, the snake Roberts with hang on, five, 10, 20, 34 name check votes. He came in at fourth. Jake Roberts is a champion, a world champion, can you see it? Would he be reliable enough? What I'm saying, Jake would have been a great champion. Because Jake did have a, I keep talking about interviews, but Jake's interview, the way he talked, he had that, uh, the voice, he had the look, he had the vibe about him that made you wonder about what is this guy like away from this camera? Or is he really like this uh, all the time? Because uh, it, he just had that interview. And Jake had something. I was talking to him one time, and he says, try not to have any wasted moves. Do you know what I mean? So you see guys now, you don't see it in WWE so much, but you do see it in AEW. They'll do a move before they do the move. Like one guy does a rolling, a rolling, I don't know, a somersault, I guess. Then he does the move. I'm thinking, what does that have to do with him? Why don't you just do the move? Because it just, I don't know. I guess he does the move to show that he can do it, I guess. But Jake, there was no there was no wasted movement with him. And I could tell that uh from the first time that I faced him, which I have a copy of the program for that night. It said Dutch Mantel versus Jake the Snake, or Jake. He wasn't the snake then, Jake Roberts. And I think that was his first match in Texas. It probably wasn't his first match ever, but it was the first match uh in the Texas territory. I think. And that's when I did this, the, the short clothesline on him. Mm -hmm. and oh, he God, we talked about this. And, uh, yeah, yeah, the, God. And, I, and he said, I'm going to take that. And he did. And people used to come to him and say, boy, Jake does that clothesline better than you. <laughs> he said, don't you wish you'd have done that first? <laughs> I said, yes, yeah, sure do. But uh, I want to, I want to harp on slightly on Jake's interviews. I mean, I think a lot of people would even put him in a top five 
promo of all time. Why was he so much more believable than other people? I mean, is he just like that in real life as well? He's just got this no, like it's... dark, brooding, mysterious thing yes. going on. Okay, if you if if you have to make make it personal, here's a guy getting in your face, and he's sounding like Jake. You're gonna take him pretty goddamn serious. Mm. You know, he says, "Hey, you know, blah blah blah," in that deep voice, and he he is he actually renders you speechless. What are you gonna do? You're gonna hit him with some kind of smart ass remark or something? No, you're looking to see what's in his hands or what he what he can hurt you with. Yes, he has that he has that vibe, and it comes through the TV screen and. There's no telling how many guys late at night are all drunk and messed up on coke or whatever, and all of a sudden they get caught up in, in Jake's personality. Oh my God! Oh, lock the door, please! Don't. <laughs> Is he out there? But, but Jake, that was. But the only thing about Jake, uh, you just brought it up, is reliability. Mm -hmm. This guy's going 320 days a year. So can he do that? Like Tyrus. Yeah, like Tyrus. <laughs> Tyrus went 20 days and it was tough. But, <laughs> but but will he do He can do it if he wanted to. But can he do it? Without, because it's been well documented that Jake had a problem with the illicit drugs and it was... Didn't we show the the pay per view, the worst pay per view of all time? We did, yes. And that was Jake. Mm. So, so if you think here's a guy that I'm in charge of booking the world champion, and Jake, I'm saying, I wonder what he can he make? Can he make San Francisco and then make Philadelphia? I don't know. <laughs> So there is like a distance of like a day and with a lot of with a lot of miles in between. So that was the only thing that would hold him back. Number two in our list with 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 43 name check votes. Yep. Scott Hall. Okay. It's going on the list. It'll go on the list now. Scott Hall, then. Uh, Scott Hall. Well, he's big. And he's... Uh, there's another guy that doesn't do any wasted moves. Got a good interview. Great appearance. And uh, he could have been a good one. Again, we run into the illicit substances. And I don't know when that came over, uh, Scott. But that would have been a well. Anybody doing doing drugs, that's that's got to be taken into consideration. I don't know exactly when Jake got on it heavily. He did end up going to who's the guy? Uh, Dang, uh, Dallas D Diamond Page. Mm -hmm. He had a he had like a rehab, not a rehab center, but a, a facility. I guess it was his house and he liked Jake and he took Jake as a patient or as a friend and helped him, uh, get off his addiction to drugs. Mm -hmm. And, and Scott, I don't know when he got, uh, kind of heavily on drugs, but if that hadn't have been a problem, he'd have been a, he'd have been a good world champion. I don't know if he'd have been the one, but we're going to see in just a second. And the most voted is 5, 10, 15, 20. I've counted this prison style, you know what I mean? Uh, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 57 votes, a clear winner. Do you know what name I'm going to say? No. Rowdy Roddy Piper. I don't know about that. Really? I don't know. And I'll tell you the reason he had a, he can only do that crazy stuff for so long. Then it gets most of your world's champions haven't been crazy. 
they've been rugged and tough. Roddy was really tough. He was crazy, but I don't know if he would have been, and I'm, I was a big fan of his too, but I don't know if he could have handled uh, or how successful he would have been as, as world champion. I just don't know. I'm not even going to put him down because I don't, I, I think that even though he got the most votes, he got the most votes on his behavior, his interviews. Because he was funny and you liked him. So, but uh, I don't know about him being world champion. So, but I, hey, just to, just to appease you, you like that word, I'm going to put his... No, 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 it's, it's your list. It's not mine. I'm, go, I'm going to put his name down because I, I, I saw the way you looked at me like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, do you know, I'm surprised you said that because as I say, the, the, Roddy's name was name checked far more than anyone else's. It was, it was yeah. a clear winner with that. But with Roddy, uh, the, the, there's been a criticism of Roddy as wrestling. My camera's going really white for some reason. Sorry, my camera's playing up, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Not the one that you can see me on, the other one. The criticism of Roddy was that you basically either have Piper's match or you have a crappy match. As essentially, you're going to have a punch and kick kind of affair, and yeah. that's more or less all you're going to get out of Roddy. So, I mean, is that what you found with, with uh, Piper? Yeah, he had one. He had really like one style. If he went out there and really wrestled, that's not Roddy Piper. That's not him. Roddy Piper was crazy and this and that and the other. And, you know, in a 20-minute or 30-minute match, how long can you do that? I don't think you could get the time out of it. And by the time it's over with, people want it to be over with. Uh, and Roddy drew a lot of money. But he drew it against uh, he drew it against hot heels, basically. Mm -hmm. He was over in Oregon. But Oregon in the in the concept of the entire wrestling business is just a is just like a territory, and it it carried a limited number of guys like you know from Florida and Memphis and all those places, and he was over there because the competition wasn't as strong. When he got to WWE, yeah, he was he was there, but Piper was never known for long matches mm -hmm. ever. 10 minute to 15 minute matches is what he was what was his range and some guys never really advanced past that range whether he could have done it i guess he could have but i guess now these are fans voting these are not say that these are the things that what, what we're doing here we're doing like the 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 board of directors of the NWA mhm mm they're figuring all this out and they have, they've heard this story and they've heard that story and this, and they're taking it all, all that in They're They're looking for a guy that's tough, believable and can, uh, reliable. Yeah. When was the first time you uh, met Roddy? I'm trying to think where you would have had crossover would Georgia. Maybe? Uh, no, no. WW. I was in Georgia, but I wasn't working for the same company. I was uh I met him in WWE, but in passing, basically. He had just come in and did some shots. Mm. And I met him there. Actually, they made me an agent for a night for some reason. Somebody wasn't there and they asked me to fill in. I said, okay. So I went in and I said, You got your match? Because <laughs> they'd had these matches everywhere. I said, same thing, same thing, same thing. And Roddy had to talk to him a minute. What do you want to do? Because I don't, and it's his match. So that's what we did. I was, I'm just going to look. I'll look at that, whatever I was doing. I was typing at the keyboard there. So uh, I'll find that out later. Okay. So how many names have you got on that list? About 10, 12. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, fourteen. Okay, then I'm going to pause for a minute, and yep. you're going to come up with your top five. So I'm going to pause, and I'll give you a minute. Okay, we're back. Dutch has taken a few minutes it. out. He's ha he's got it. He's got it. So how many names? We've got top Ox five. Let me let me do my Ox Baker impression. Ah. That's what he do all the time. <laughs> all right, let's go. He had a lovely singing voice over here. 
Oh, he again. did. Oh, he was good. He was great. So, okay, you've got you a top ready five. For this? Well, you've, yes, you've got I a do. top five, but you also said there's a couple of honorable mentions. Yes, they are. Uh, my next to last honorable mention is Scott Hall. Mm-hmm. And for the same thing, and, and they're both kind of eliminated from the top five, not because of uh, work rate or expertise or wrestling ability, but it's because unreliability because of their, their background. Let me say they were unreliable. And and, uh, the last one I have, this is like number, if we have the top five, then two uh, at number seven would be Scott Hall. Mm Mm-hmm. Next to him, and I love these guys, but he was great to watch work. I used to love to watch his matches because they were, you know, one person's match. After you watch one, you might watch a few more, but this guy's matches differed every night according to who he's working with. And and unlike Ric Flair, because Ric Flair did the same thing for 20 years. You know, outside, off the top rope, hit him, bump, take the bump, big slam. But uh, Jake the Snake. Mm. Jake the Snake Roberts comes in at number six. And again, not because of his work, not because of his interviews, but because... Uh, you didn't know when those demons would take over. And when you have a world champion, there's a lot of money riding on this guy. And he's booked 300 days a year, so he has to be able to go. Which is a tribute to Flair, you know. I think Flair shoots a lot of shit out of his mouth. But when he was working those 320 days a year and working out and drinking like he did, he is a tough son of a gun. He was probably... He, he was a great world champion, drew a lot of money. So we got in number seven, Scott Hall. Mm-hmm. Number six is Snake. Mm-hmm. Coming in at number five, and this may shock you, Stephen Regal. Really? Yes. That does shock me. Because he was British. He was a... Uh, a non-American. He's probably an American now. And he had a great interview and a great presence. So, and I've told people this, I've told guys from the UK that when they get over here in the United States and they start talking into that, that, that English that they use, you immediately feel like inferior (laughs) (laughs) just by the language. Hey, mate. <laughs> but I think he would have been, a, and he had a great interview, and he was a pretty big guy, too. He was about 6'2", about 240, and he just had certain moves that that would infuriate uh, American fans, and I think he would have been Japanese fans, too. But he certainly had the, had, had the interview and the presence. He comes in at number five. Mm. Coming in at number four on the Dutch and James's top five of all time to be future NWA heavyweight champions would be my good friend, Mr. Rick Rude Mm. at number four. And again, I'm, I'm putting a lot of attention on presence and on ability and I think, and while Rick wasn't as good as as Regal, I think he could uh, you know, there's all kind of different styles at work. And I think he had a style and the body that, that would work. Yeah, he, he looks and, good on a poster. Rick Rude certainly does. Yeah. And he's a good looking guy. Women love him. And let's face what wrestling is. It's, it's male burlesque, basically. That's what it is. I heard a guy say one time, my wife will only go with me to wrestling. 
I went, well, you idiot. She's going in. Because <laughs> she's looking at the guy just like her taking you to a strip show, basically. And my wife always takes about 25 minutes to get back from the concession stands. Oh, my God. Hey, there's a good story about that, too. I have to tell one day mm -hmm. about a girl who left the, con the, the ringside to go to the concession stand, and she got back about 30 minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a line, eh? Oh, it's a true story. It's a true story. <laughs> Told to me by Mr. Robert Fuller. I can tell that. Yes. So, nice. Because. So he comes in at number four, Robert. Uh, I mean, Rick Rude. Number three, another old friend of mine, Mr. Paul Orndorff. Number, number three. And I knew Orndorff in Florida. Years ago, and he hadn't really started wrestling. He was just a friend of Mike Graham, who was the son of the legendary promoter in Florida, Eddie Graham. And he was just a friend. And I knew nothing of his background, but everybody I talked to, because I was an I was an outsider. I wouldn't, I didn't grow up in Florida. So everybody I talked to, when you bring up Orndorff's name, they said, boy, that's one, that's one kick-ass MFR that he is. And he played for the University of Tampa. He was a running back. He played pro ball, I think, one or two years. But he was a one hell of an athlete and a nice guy who didn't take any bullshit from anybody. But when he talked to me, it was he was so respectful. And he was, he was talking to me one day, and I went, "Wait a minute, why is this guy talking to me?" I was, I didn't even know him, but he he came up to talk to me, and he said, "Mike told me you're a you're a hell of a worker, and if I wanted to learn something, come, you know, come and talk to you." And I went, "Really?" See, I, that was something I didn't even know, but now 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 he showed that he's willing to learn, and I never worked with him because I left or something happened, but. But he got better, a lot better. And I think he was in the – wasn't he in the first WrestleMania or second WrestleMania? Orndorff. Yeah, he was, in, he was in the main event. He was tagging against Hulk Hogan. So that's how far – and Hogan was another friend from Florida. They all knew each other growing up. And they all went to high school together. So – and they all had stories about Orndorff kicking somebody's ass – at some drive-in restaurant or whatever. Like, a, you know, you drive in and you order off the little kiosk outside. They said there's been several instances of when guys say something to him, he just got out and just beat the crap out of them. And there's only like three or four punches thrown, and he'd throw three of them. And the guys all laid out. But they had a lot of respect for Paul Orndorff. So, and I have a lot of respect to, uh, for him, too. Uh, he's He's passed away now. And we lost a good one. Mm -hmm. So condolences to your family, Mr. Powell. Number two, met this guy years ago that would have been a great, I think, a great NWA heavyweight champion. Uh, and Mr. Arn Anderson. Ah. The reason I and I've already given why he would be a a, a good champion. Great interview. And he there was no bullshit to him. Like Harley Race was the champion, but there was no bullshit to Harley. Harley didn't want to do anything that the people would chuckle at. He said, nope, we in the wrestling business, not the comedy business. So, and Double A would have been very good. He was really, he wasn't that tall either, but he was tall enough. Look at my little blue spot there. Uh, he was tall enough. He was just tall enough. You know, we talked about Owen Hart a little earlier. He was a little too short, I think. And I do think that they they make too much of size. But Arn was an, and a great talker. Because when he's talking, and I used to like 
you know, when you're talking and I, I forgot where I was, but they taught me this technique when a guy's talking and you know, he's going to be talking for a minute. They would slowly bring that camera in very slowly. And before you know it, you're right in his face and he's talking right to you. That is a, a production technique that's very effective. So he's the number two guy. The number one guy that I picked out of these 14 names, you give me like 50 names. Yeah, I gave you the rest as well, but gave you about 120. You didn't give me that many. I gave you enough. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you gave me enough. God, an asthma attack halfway through. Out of of all of these, who do you think I picked? Okay, I'm going to write the name down in my hand so uh, the viewers cannot see. Yep. Is it that well how did you know that i just guessed see tell me who it is that's a that's that's a good guess that's really a good guess out of these hundred people the names you gave me ted dibiase okay could you tell by the way i described him before yeah we didn't uh we didn't talk too much about him but i could tell you're definitely a fan now, tell the now fans you may say bullshit they probably went on one of their like little breaks and said hey i'm gonna say this and you tell them how smart i am and i was you know but i didn't tell him really i i did not no do you know what but i can t- tell i can tell by the reaction and also i've circled so i'll show this to the people actually i've circled some names you can see <laughs> on top there like the maybe like the top 10 and i remember that you were particularly enthusiastic about ted so yeah. he wasn't picked yet and i've thought of him because the only other people around him were roddy piper who you've discounted scott hall who you've already said jake that you've already said orndorf and rick rude you've already said owen you discounted magnum ta uh i didn't think you'd pick i'm surprised you went arn anderson so high yeah uh, jimmy snooker i know you discounted and uh we mentioned goldus regal butch reed a couple of others as well wahoo mcdaniel we mentioned as well but uh enough about uh, th- this list uh, tell me about your pick and why. Head is a workhorse. And that's what an NWA champion has to be. He has to be able to adapt to almost anybody's style. That's where Roddy Piper that what disqualified him. I don't I don't think he would fit with some of these regional champions or regional, you know, challenges. I don't think he could he would have had very good matches with them. And th- this whole list, they could have a match with a broomstick and get it over. Ted was, he just, he, he just had that interview about him, the work about him. But Ted's interview wasn't his strongest part. His work is, and he could adapt to anybody. So that's, that's why I picked him. So, there's a pretty good list here. See, uh, another one who should have been on may have on that list too is uh, Orton Jr. Yes, I mentioned him. He was mentioned yeah, three he's, times he's, in the list. Yeah, he's good. And Blanchard, I think he is borderline. Ray Stevens is borderline to Wahoo Go Dust because of the gimmick. Uh, Jimmy Snooker, I don't think would have made it at all. I think he's. They did something about him. I don't think that his interview is horrible. Oh God, yeah, bro, bro, or what do you, bra, or whatever they say. Brother. Yeah. Where the moon and the sky. It's just, just rattle. It's like, it like a more like 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 Ultimate Warrior, but he'd like smoked a big fat joint beforehand. So it's like a way more relaxed <laughs> version. Well, you've heard the story about the woman dying. Yes, very much so, yeah. We need to take that up one day. We need to talk about that. Next week. How about that then? I'll write it down in the okay. list and I will put it in there. You know what else we need to take up? Cool. The Scott Hall when he killed a guy. There's a lot less information about that as well. I don't care. We'll make something up. That's fine. Okay, then. And we yeah, body we'll slammed make it him up. and he was three yeah, tons. And then, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, and he slammed him and the guy... He he died right then. <laughs> well, 
but we, you've heard the st- you've heard the story, right? Yeah, I think uh, wasn't Scott Hall defending himself, or he was a bouncer at a club, and he was a bouncer. On him, yeah. was a, hey, you well, can't tell too, you, you can't tell too much. No, 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 no. We're going to leave it. What's We're the leave purpose of listing next week? Exactly. There See, will not be unless I'm trying we to say t- a cliffhanger. Our co-host See? cliffhanger is uh, <laughs> the. Hey, that's un- a good name. The unspoken, the unspoken co-host cliffhanger for next week. All right, then I'm going to do the outro. Thank you very much for watching and listening. And we're going to make it quick because. Hey, frankly, I, I actually enjoyed today. I think this, I, I normally this don't is say like, this. This was a great this show. Is, this is like a, a trip in a car where you're talking to somebody who knows a little bit, and you're talking to somebody else who knows a little bit. But together, they know quite a bit. See what I mean? And people said, hell, I didn't know that. Or I knew that. Or they can say, that's not right. And folks, if you think we're not right, send a message Send a message to James. No, Dutch. Send a message no, to Dutch. No. I won't read it. Or I'll read <laughs> the first line and think, oh, forget it, and move on. Oh, I, I, I read all my mail. And by the way, you see these books back here, folks, these uh, Tales from the Dirt Road and the World According to the Dutch. They are on sale from me personally, and I'll autograph them for you. All you gotta do is write me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with what, James? Two L's. With two L's at gmail.com. Ask me about it. And also, while you're at it, ask me about getting a copy of the University of Dutch diploma that not everybody has. And they're reasonably priced. I'm not going to price you out, but there you have something that you know you have. And these are not even collectibles. These are actually books you can pick up and read, and you'll read them again next year, and you'll read them the year after that, and then pass them on. Because one thing about these books is they're like they're child friendly. They're you don't see. I don't call anybody out for being an alcoholic, or a drug addict, or gay are uh, transphobe or whatever they are, are racist. I don't say anything about that. Yeah, all anybody <laughs> anybody can read these books. All the drunk transphobic pedophiles have their names redacted in those books. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, when you read there, you see all these things that are scrubbed out. But I didn't do it. No, but anybody can read these books. You know, you could read it to your grandmother, mm-hmm. and she wouldn't be offended. Having said that, I've got two books as well. You saw them at the beginning. I have a new podcast out with Shane Douglas uh, called the Universe uh, Franchise University. I'm sorry, with Shane Douglas. We've only just agreed on the name. And you can find those on the YouTube channel, Shane Douglas Official. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Dutch, we the people. We the people. See you next week.